I like that it gives you the countdown. Mm-hmm. Honestly, it makes it a lot easier to know what's going on. Can you ever see those YouTube videos where the people they they stream live, and there's that two second thing where they're going, "Hey everybody," you know what I mean? Because <laughs> like, oh, they're checking to see if it's all working and stuff, but it's actually streaming and it's actually recording, and it's kind of embarrassing. Always. So it's a two or three second. Is this actually on? Is this thing on? Is this, uh, let me check my other screen. Yeah. We might have just had that. I don't know. I, I'm starting to put the thing on the, the YouTube, right? Because oh. why, why not? I think, I think there's people, oddly, um, who would enjoy that. Why not? And we don't have a two second delay. We have like a 30 <laughs> minute delay. So why not? <laughs> it's, been, uh, it's been a minute. As the kids say, mm-hmm. you and I, I haven't checked the records, but it's probably been s- like half a year since we've connected on this. Well, do you know what happened today? Because on, you said the YouTube, the Facebook told me something today. Yeah. Do you know what happened 10 years ago today? A decade. Did we meet? Apparently, according to the fa- and the Facebook is never wrong. Right. <laughs> Apparently, we sat down, and this will be a test for anyone listening. If how long they've been listening to you and I gabber on the internet. Apparently, a decade ago today, you and I sat down and recorded a little five gallon podcast episode. Oh, is this some sort of like an anniversary? Because that, wow, oh, I remember that show. I love that show. I miss that show. That was the impetus for a lot of conversations that I've had mm-hmm. with a lot of people. My whole career started with that show. Do you know that? Ten years ago, where were we? Echo, I think. I assume. Oh, I feel like I was in Santana. Well, what's, and... what, what year is it now? What? <laughs> <laughs> so it's, oh, you know what? If it was... T- okay. Let's go by the assumption that Facebook is correct on anything. Okay. Then that would be 2014. At that time, I was living at the beach. We were living at the beach. That's when that was. That's the beach. Yeah, but that was certainly not the first time that that you and I got together on that podcast. No. The first time for me, I think it was 2010. Me and Brian Medina. Hey, Brian. And I think McNutt. The three of us. And you invited us to come on your show. We We knew you had a podcast. (laughs) I I remember being like, what? (laughs) <laughs> microphones internet what what's going on so i think 2010 would be the first time that i sat down that was my podcasting introduction so that's 14 years ago how long when did you start that show do you remember yeah uh 2005 oh <laughs> <laughs> so n- 19 <laughs> years ago um it was me and my then uh partner in listowel and i had a, a studio in a basement of a house we were renting. Nice. And the year prior to that, I saw on television a radio host that I followed um, talking about doing his podcast. I'm like, what the heck? So I Googled that. And uh, it turns out that was, oh, an interesting thing that you could do. Grab some mics, sit around, talk about stuff. So not to go deep into the annals of the history of my podcasting world, but I, uh, I found a guy in Colorado who could host the podcast on his server for five bucks a month. I'm like, okay, that sounds good. And then I had to go into uh, an RSS feed generator and like hand uh-huh. roll the XML file so that the RSS worked properly. Don't even know what that means. And then I had to like manually contact Apple to submit it to then iTunes for consideration in the iTunes store. What happened was... That podcast was one of the first like hundred shows in Apple uh, iTunes when they announced that they supported podcasts. So we got a ridiculously large number of <laughs> listeners in a very short period of time, right? Because Apple did their big announcement. It's like podcast is being rolled into iTunes. And the guy in Colorado for five bucks a month sent me an email after month two and said, I can't do this for five dollars a month. Like, right. there's way too much stress on the server. And anyway, I contacted the folks then who were the founders of Libsyn. 
because they were doing this thing. It's like, yeah, give us five bucks and we'll have this sort of elastic bandwidth thing for you. So long story short, 2006, I was like podcasting when you kind of had to like hand roll a lot of that stuff and figure out how to even get it distributed, let alone get people to listen to it right that was the the second challenge is like right. people heard the word maybe sort of but they're like what is that and how do i even listen to it well there was we, no like there's no youtube in 2005 right was no. there even google like google 1998 oh, yeah. 98 mm-hmm. apple i just searched it. apple didn't like apple launched in 2001 itunes and then the ipod in 2002 it seems like so yeah, you're like podcast, you're right in there with all that. Podcast support happened in iTunes in around I think 2005, 2006, somewhere in there, maybe 2004. So it's funny, like I I, I used to go to these podcasting conferences, and uh, there's like the old guard, the curmudgeon of the industry, and I'm like one of them, right? <laughs> <laughs> I was one of the guys that that had one of the like the OG hundred shows on on Apple Podcasts. Okay. Um, and I yeah. just remember, man, like I remember sitting down with you and, you know, we, we, we became friends pretty quickly in the Costa Rica years. And just you invited us to come on the show and it was a weekly thing. And pretty regularly we would set, sit down, we'd have like a Sunday barbecue at your place and have a little dinner, have a little drinks and then podcast. And that became a really nice routine. I remember, like, I remember that fondly, really, really fun. And we just continued to do it. And here we are, like what, you know, 15 years later, you and I still doing this. It's so... The Facebook is good for something. It's good for, I, you know, I went back on the Facebook. I, I reactivated my account. I took a little hiatus for a while from that and and uh, Instagram. And I have just no presence anymore on X. And I've come back and it's like, oh, I, I can see, you know, some people doing some stuff. I can have my kind of boomer experience there. Mm-hmm. Um, that, so it's good for a couple things, but then for the most part, it's it's uh it still it turns out is a bit of a dumpster fire of a, a place to go for kind of anything. Anything, yeah, yeah. It's uh, I've been Maya doesn't have Facebook, bless her, which is good. But we've been roped into our our condo has a Facebook group where you get like updates on stuff and like this and that. So like, kind of one of us has to have it because you gotta like we kind of like want to send a message. I'm sure people do. We like look, is there another way that do, do we have to have the Facebook to, to do this? Um, yep. But I, I just, we, I, I, I have it. So we'll, I'll just pass the updates over. But some things, I guess, I mean, the condo is old, you know, we haven't been here that long, but it's existed for a while. So I guess in, at the time, Facebook was the only one or the easiest way everyone used it. But now there's got to be a better way to communicate those things. One would hope, because as you know, in a lot of countries, Facebook basically is the internet, yeah. right? One of the reasons, though, I did reactivate was because I am about to do a bit of a spring clean, you know, go through the storage and sell some instruments and I've got some furniture mm. stuff. I got it, you know, ain't nothing like Facebook Marketplace to get somebody to show up in 45 minutes with cash in their hand to take something out of your house. You tell nothing me. Nothing like it. Yep. It's super fast. Sold a bunch of stuff in the spring. Like people, do, yeah, <laughs> I've never been, never expected like, oh, I can be there in 20 minutes. What? Oh, sure. Yeah, great. Fantastic. <laughs> I was at my mom and dad's place one summer, many moons ago, and there was a, you know, they had a hot tub in the back like people once did, but they didn't use it for years as people often don't. And they're like, oh, we, we don't want this hot tub anymore. We want to get rid of it, but I don't know. Da, 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 da. I'm like, do you want any money for it? And they're like, no. I said, okay. Bum, 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 bum. Two hours later, four guys in a pickup truck show up from Kitchener, Waterloo, and they're hauling that thing out of there for nothing, right? So, you know, there's one of the values of Facebook for me is people will come take shit out of my life. Absolutely. <laughs> and when we moved, in, before we moved here in the old place, we were getting rid of stuff that we didn't need anymore. And I've, I've discovered it's really difficult. You can sell a lot of things on Facebook Marketplace, Kijiji, Craigslist, whatever you're using. You can't really sell a couch. I learned that, which makes sense. Because if it was, if I'm buying a used couch, just there's a whole lot of uh, nuance <laughs> in there. But you know what you can do? You can get two university dudes in their 20s to show up in their truck and take your couch for free and take it away for free. That's what you can do. 
a couch is, in my experience, one grade above mattress for mm -hmm. asking money for this thing, right? Mm -hmm. Mattress, you got, you've got other mental issues you need to address first before you try and get someone to give you money for your used mattress. The couch, you're really pushing it, okay? If you've got a designer couch that you have in your third, you know, pied de terre that you go to for one month of the year, maybe, maybe, but you have to say, I have a pied de terre and I only go once a month. You have to, you know, preface this whole thing and then you have to find the right buyer and they're still going to come in and say, yeah, but we know you did it on it, right? Yeah. We know you did. Somebody passed out on this thing and something happened. There's no way. It's a couch, right? So you got to give it away. There's vomit stories and there's the whole button, everything, the whole, right. the whole nine. You can sell a bed frame, but you can't sell a mattress. I mean, that's just the way it goes. Box spring, there's, there's a, there's between the couch and the mattress, there's a box spring. That's where it's like, oh, you're really pushing your luck to get somebody to give you money for that thing. <laughs> you could probably sell an ottoman. I would say anything, you know, what, you know, twice a year, they go around and they pick up the things. Mm -hmm. Anything that you would see normally discarded on the side of the road is not a thing one should ask money for. I think that's maybe the rule of thumb. No. I learned that very quickly. Even like you just put up 50 bucks, doesn't matter. No one's like, no, no. Free. <laughs> you get the university kids being like, I can be there in 10 minutes. I live in Cambridge, but I will, I'm coming. Like, right. Because right. you know how much it costs to get rid of stuff? <laughs> like, if you will save me that expense of calling 1-800-JUNK or whatever it is to come and take your stuff away, it's sold. So they came uh, I just said, you know, it's it's a couch, <laughs> so I hope you're bringing a buddy or something because it's heavy. Like, no, no, right? We got it. I'll bring my friends, and they they came, and you know, it's a little bit of uh, trepidation in your mind because it's just me. It's it was dark. It wasn't late, but it was you know, seven o'clock in the late fall here in Canada, so it's dark, and you're like, well, all these three dudes from wherever are showing up to, but it was all fine. <laughs> it's all good. Took the couch. Have a nice life. Give it a good deep clean, gentlemen. I had uh, called 1-800-GOT-JUNK uh, once for a mattress, right? Because it's like <laughs> <laughs> somebody's got to take this thing. And even if I put it on Facebook for free, it's pretty sketch. We, we hear because we're in a condo um, when I would sell something of relative value on Facebook. I'll go meet him in the lobby. So I remember once like I was selling a, an iMac. So I went down to the lobby and I plugged it in and I turned it on and I had like almost like a little shop going down there in the lobby, right? So that the, whoever comes in, it's like, all right, you're on camera. You're not coming in my house. It's not going to be weird. Because you never. I'm not going to some parking lot of a grocery store at three in the morning to sell my iMac. That iMac's gone and maybe my wallet too. Yeah. Right? Yeah. 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 It's it's funny, man. Like you can like the tech stuff online sells in an instant. You know, like we bought a new TV here a year ago. I don't know, and so we're selling the previous one. With I think I made the the Facebook Marketplace ad. Let's just say at five forty five. By six twenty, the TV was literally out of our house, gone. Right. And that makes you think like oh, I should charge. I put like, put it for one hundred and fifty bucks. I think you know. And so like a, I bought it, it was my first purchase, I think, when I moved back from Costa Rica. So 2014, so this was last year. So nine-year-old TV, you know, worked great, fine. 150 bucks, I thought, probably too much, but let's see what happens immediately. Like, hey, I can be at your place in 10 minutes. Is it still there? Like, and <laughs> couple, like, nice couple shows up, guy comes in, you know, you plug it in. Does it work? Yeah, whatever. And he just asked... Does it have YouTube? That was the only question he asked. And I was like showing him, I was like, don't care. Does it have YouTube? I'm like, yeah, here's YouTube, opens the app. Because it's an old TV, so it doesn't like have the download. It's just like, it's in pre-installed okay, yeah. and like whatever. Right. right. And he's like, can I play Baby Shark? Oh God. <laughs> and I'm like, dude, you can do whatever you want. For YouTube, you could do, he's like, I just need it for our toddler, like, I, like that's the only reason they were buying it is like I guess it's a giant iPad like it's just a screen that they need for mm -hmm. and then I just I, I remember I have that 
Baby shark, dun, 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 baby shark, dun, dun, all in my mind all day long after Don't that. Don't get me but going. Don't get me going. All I wanted was a screen for for Baby Shark. So yeah, any any tech thing, gone in half an hour. Just just gone. He's implemented into his own home a perpetual torture device for himself yeah. and his partner. I mean, yeah. like I had a, I got a niece and nephew. They went through their Baby Shark phases. It's it's ridiculous. It's really hard. It should be legal, honestly. Well, good for him though because. You're right. The electronic stuff goes super fast. The IKEA stuff, if it's in good shape, you can almost sell it for what you paid for it because it's assembled. I learned that pretty quick. Mm. There are some folks that are like, "Oh, it's in perfect shape, and I'll have to put it together." Even better, right? Depends on what vehicle they come to pick it up in, and depends on what it is. Because uh-huh. I did have a guy who bought our. Uh, headboard like the bed the bed behind the head that was you know nice one yeah. goes on the wall you know so we yeah. but he came in like uh <laughs> you know like a toyota camry or something like uh, no it's not yeah. no oh, oh. that's not, not gonna happen so here we are but he was a professional facebook marketplacer because he's like you know what i got in my trunk i got my toolbox and he went back <laughs> inside brought his toolbox and he just sat there and he's like do you mind if i just like whatever disassemble he, it. yeah he disassembled it i gave him a little ziploc bag to put the screws in and everything and off he went so yes i think you can if it's assembled for sure but the pros know if they don't have the vehicle for it that i learned that lesson because i sold a barbecue recently and the question i asked the guy was like before you come over here what are you driving because right. you know this is a barbecue and i have not disassembled this thing so and then he's like no no i got it and he <laughs> This guy was a civil engineer and he was like, no, no. And he knew exactly how to finagle that thing right into his hatchback. So, Jeez. We just bought our second barbecue. We have, we're a two barbecue family now, by the way. Yeah. So we have the, we have the charcoal one, Mm -hmm. right? With a little crank on it to raise and lower the, the charcoal to temp and stuff. So that's nice. You're doing something fancy like kebabs and everything. You want to do that. But, Sometimes I just want to throw something on the grill, but I don't want to go out and buy propane all the time because you never run out at the right time. And I don't want to be a two tank guy. We got a condo. We have natural gas out there. Right? Okay. So it, it turns out, because I didn't know, you go to the Canadian Tire, whatever, when they're on sale, you get a nice convertible barbecue and there, there's a kit in there. You can either assemble it to be a propane barbecue or a natural gas barbecue. There's I'm never kit. out of gas. I'm barbecuing every day. I'm not even thinking. I'm just firing that thing up because we don't even pay for the gas. It's just part of the, the condo. Right. So now I'm going to get like a splitter and do a line to the fire bowl. And I'm just going to 24-7 just barbecue and fire bowl out there. Just let it go all year long. You're going to get a letter. I'm going to get a letter. Probably from the letter. municipality. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Does your... So our condo board or whatever you call them there's no propane allowed anymore essentially so every unit has a natural oh. gas hookup so natural gas okay. no problem but our hookup is in the front and our, so the reason we sold the barbecue was because we don't have a natural gas hookup in the back so we're like well can't use it can't use propane anymore so and then we have an air fryer we have like other things that we kind of use Never barbecue in the winter ever. We're not. I'm not. We're not that kind of people. So we were able to sell it, and then we bought a dining room, IKEA dining room table with the money. So it kind of worked out quite nicely for okay. outdoor for outdoor seating. But yeah, you're allowed. Are you allowed to use propane over there? Sounds like it. Yeah, Ours was yeah, out for sure. last year. Okay. No, no issues here. We're in Quebec. You know, go for it. <laughs> blow it up. That's a weird placement for natural gas. I wonder what the thinking is to have it in the front. I don't know. I don't know. It's too. It's unfortunate. It's too bad. That is really too bad. Because let me tell you, once you go natural gas on a barbecue, that anxiety, that propane anxiety, is gone. You ever remember, heard it? It's all there. Years ago, like in Costa Rica, I was a two tank guy, right? I always just have a second tank full, and just rotate them through. I, I'm a, I'm a belt and suspenders on a couple of things, Woody, and and one of them's propane tanks. The other is aluminum foil when it comes to barbecuing. <laughs> You know what I'm saying? Because you're barbecuing. You're grabbing your foil. You're doing your thing. It's always when you're barbecuing that you run out of foil. It's always then. 
Oh, it's, you know, so, so I'm like, there's always a there's back stock of foil. And when I started dating my partner, she would notice in my place, she's like, you have like three or four rolls of aluminum foil. And I'm like, you ever run out of aluminum foil? I said, she's like, all the time. I'm like, never again. You will never run out of foil again as long as you're with me. <laughs> it's a good feeling. That's security. That's the kind of security women are looking for, I'm telling you. Aluminum foil security. Yep. What else are you like that with? Toilet paper? No, we got a bunch. We got backstock on toilet paper, paper yeah. towels, paper uh, towel. facial tissue. I have backstock on hand soap. I got backstock on toothbrushes and toothpaste. I, you, I, the stuff that you run out of that's the most inconvenient to run out of, I never run out of it. I always your pandemic replenish. Proof. Next pandemic, you're ready to go. Depends on the length. <laughs> Depends on the length. You know, you give me like one of these multi-year pandemics, we might have an issue, but you know, you're going to tell me for two weeks we're locked down. I'm fine. Are you Costco people? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, you know, sadly, because, well, maybe not sadly, there are a couple things that are really delicious. You know, they, they've got really good fresh mozzarella cheese, really good and a good price. It's expensive, that stuff out there. They got organic eggs good price you know so there's a couple things that are like we do our groceries there and try and avoid temptation island right all of the other stuff that's the that makes your your trip seven hundred dollars all of a sudden we get dollar fifty hot dogs at costco too i stay away they from compete the nitrates with the dollar ikea hot dogs i just i try and stay away from them now it's just they're poison sticks those things Yes, Worse they than are. cigarettes. Yes, they <laughs> you guys. I'm assuming you guys Costco. You you Costco. Is that a verb? No, we're not Costco people. No, no membership. Don't Nothing. get in the car every couple of weeks. Go out there and get like a ten mm. gallons of mayonnaise. You don't know. Do that. That's why I'm always fascinated by people. Like that's why I asked them if you're Costco people because you got all the, the stock. You got all the aluminum foil. You got the toothpaste. I'm assuming you're not walking into, you know, Shoppers Drug Mart and buying ten toothpaste. So I figured you were Costco. Is this a we, political uh, position you've taken? Is this, what is this? <laughs> <laughs> no, we don't need that much. Like we're two people. So we don't, uh, that's one rationale. We don't need that much stuff Two, we're, we're the, you know, when you lived in Hakko mm -hmm. and you, you, you liked the, the five minute walkabout, you need something, you need something, mm -hmm. going, you know, we're those people yep. now. We live in a neighborhood where within five minutes of walking, Everything's there. So you need toothpaste, five minutes, you got it. You need this, you need yep. that. So we just, we do that. And for our grocery shop, there's a supermarket we're five minutes drive away. Um, but we also do Instacart and stuff like that. So, you know, it's we live in a pretty a good neighborhood where you don't, and then the Costco near us is 30 minutes away, basically. Right, right. And I have no interest in getting in the, the weekend line, basically, for that. Well, I mean, it's it's a proximity issue for us, right? We moved to the burbs, basically, right? So we're in the, the lower Laurentians, which is not the city. So I'm the same. Like, I much prefer to feel like, oh, I'm going to make dinner tonight. I'm going to walk to the market and see what I pick up. I love that, right? But there's no walking to the market. I can walk to the IGA, <laughs> you know, which is like 20 <laughs> minutes. And... It's not a great selection there. Or I can, you know, drive right. to another grocery store that's 20 minutes away. So the Costco is a 20-minute drive. If you time it, though, because I'm not, uh, you know, my work schedule is asynchronous to a lot of the world. So I get to go at 2 in the afternoon. There's no lines. There's no people. It's great. And I have a very efficient do ka do ka do I come in. I, I know what I'm getting, and I get out of there. So I can keep it to, you know, 200 bucks. I got eggs for the next two weeks. <laughs> right. <laughs> Uh, we did go, my sister lives, my sister has a membership and she lives down in the Niagara region. And so we yeah. did go, I don't know, six months ago or something. We were down visiting and she, ah, come on, let's go to Costco. And it is like a little, it's like a, like a food Disney world in there, honestly. Like they have anything you want. It's all great. And then like, I, I don't know if it was just this store. I'm assuming it's all the same. Their appliances are way cheaper. Like you want to oh, buy yeah. a fridge? You know, buy a microwave, TV. Great like place to get a TV, yeah. 20% yeah. less than basically anywhere else. 
Definitely. And they have a one-year, no questions. This is like a Costco ad. No questions asked. Return policy. You can take. You can buy a vacuum. Use it for 364 days. Go back on 365 and say, I don't like it. And they're fine. They give you your money back. Wow. Just buy another vacuum. Haven't done it. Could. <laughs> let me tell you, I've returned some stuff. You know, and they don't care. Whatever. Whatever. As long as it's, I think it's like underwear, then they're good to go. Um, but you know what? I, there's a thing, though, that you, you necessarily have to start doing when you live in the burbs is it because of the way it's all laid out you don't have the options right it's it's kind of like a little prison that they've locked you into you have to be part of this bubble and costco and walmart are necessarily part of that bubble right and then you know what happens you turn 49 and you start going on the internet and start telling people costco's great you gotta go to costco like i'm doing this is how they get you <laughs> How did you how did you transition? How did you guys transition to burp life? What was the impetus? Because we're always like, like you're naturally always thinking about your next move and things like this. And just with real estate in Canada, like basically staying in a, a city is essentially it's not really feasible for for most people, us included. Like if the next step up, kind of kind of thing. How did you guys transition to to burp life? Not well. <laughs> Still haven't. Not well, like because I'm from rural Ontario, but it was you pretty grew up easy in for Paris, me, right? Yeah, I grew up in a small town, right? So living in a small town in rural Quebec was fine, um, in many regards. I'm used to it, but I, I will say, having lived in the city for a long time, and having lived on the beach for a long time, this is not the compromise. This is not the oh, it's the best of both worlds. It's the worst of both worlds right so you have the the concrete and the crappy buildings and the noise and the, everything of the city without all of the accoutrement and nice things about living in the city the culture the vibe the restaurants the and you can say oh i've got all the best parts of nature but you don't you have kind of the worst parts of nature which is like little itty bitty walking paths with a couple trees that everyone says is so nice up here because there's so much nature you have like a little creek that rolls through and it's like oh you got a river there it's that ain't no river so it's it's all this sort of faux city faux nature mm. no anything it's like if vanilla had a vanilla flavor like <laughs> more vanilla than vanilla it's that with a little bit of uh, not necessarily suicidal tendencies but it's like if there's a way that you can just almost take your own life but live long enough to be aware of how horrible the suffering is it's like that with with more parking and that's how you became costco people Cause that's that's the good part of the day we've been breaking it up so for a variety of reasons going back and forth to a place like costa rica balances it all kind of out but honestly it's a kid thing right because you know we want to be close to the the niece and nephew across the street so that's why we moved here but honestly as as we go through our own uh journey towards parenthood I can tell you, I don't know if living in the burbs is, is the way to go. I, I, would, I would much rather live like way out in the country and have like a little hobby farm and go into town once a week. Right. Or just full on live in the city, right? And uh, on the weekends, get out of town and go out to the countryside. Well, in the GTA, it's, it sounds very similar to what you're describing, right? It used to be like, you know, if you can't afford where you currently live, just keep driving until you, you can in terms of like buying something, right? But even now, like in the GTA, like you'd have to go way, like you're, you're rural, you're in the woods, right? Because everything is basically the same. And they've built these suburban communities that used to be individual cities that are just all the same thing now, basically. Yeah. Um, that have the same, from what I can see, the same kind of life experience as you've described it, where you just have these malls where everyone goes shopping and you have the, the, the city, the concrete of the city and not the culture part. So I think that's basically what, what it's become. Um, so it's now it's turning into like you go rural, rural, like you go way out and you have, you can't see your neighbors <laughs> and you go into town once, once a week or, 
yeah, I guess you stay in, in the city and you sacrifice on some things in terms of like the actual housing part, size, etc. But you win on the the walkabout, the five minute, get everything, the convenience, the vibe, the culture, the different kinds of food, the people you meet, those kinds of things. We're, we live in a place called Blenville, but we're really closer to a community called Rosemare. So it's like, you know, you got to go over... Get off the island of Montreal, go over another island, get back to the mainland, and that's where we are. And it used to be, not that long ago, that those were all independent rural communities, right? But now, like it is in Toronto, it's just this contiguous connected tissue of the city, but that's not really the city, right? So you can still fall, like, but because we're at the north edge of that, in, you know, 30 minutes, we're in Mont Tremblant, we're up in ski resorts and stuff. So there's lots of nature just north of us, you know, 15 minutes, we're in the woods, and it's great. But at the same time, it's like, I don't think we've ever transitioned to it, because we're never really happy here. We like being in our condo, because we found a nice condo, and it's a nice bubble. But then when we have to go out and do stuff, we're like, oh, <laughs> it's... <laughs> it's not fun. It's, it's, it's impossible to go and have fun. Every everything is just not good, but not terrible. It's just mm -hmm. everything sits in between. Which is, I'd rather have everything be terrible. Okay, fine. Don't go out to eat, or everything be great. Go out and eat all the time. Then this in between where it's impossible to decide: Do I really want to go have a mediocre anything? And that's what all the experiences are like here. Right. I grew up in Scarborough, which you know, as a kid growing up, you know, like you, it is, it's, that's your environment. You don't really have anything to compare it to, you know, looking back, maybe it was like that. I don't know, but it is the epitome of suburban, like Toronto, basically, even though, okay, quote unquote, it's part of the city, whatever, but it's its own city, right? There's no transit for all intents and purposes. There's two subway stations in Scarborough. It's a humongous area. There's buses that take forever to go anywhere so it's car central right people ask me all the time well would you move back to scarborough yada, yada. i'm like i don't think so because then the lifestyle completely like here where we walk everywhere basically anywhere we need to go we walk, walking you can ride a bike yeah we have a car we can we can take it but scarborough you, you there's no walking anywhere the store is a 15 minute drive away you know depending on, on where you are and so and I, I don't want to revisit revisit that and even as you drive i remember being very young and we lived in ajax when i was born and mm. i remember kind of driving and you could see like fields there's very clear physical dividers yep. between the city and then pickering and ajax fields farms whatever now unless there were signs welcome to ajax like you could drive two hours east and you would think it's all toronto like you'd have no idea it all is no dividers it looks exactly and this is not like a big complaint on like, but this is just, it's just, it's all one metropolis essentially where most of it has that lifestyle. I think that, that you've described is probably a Costco in each of those, each of those little areas. Well, I mean, I know a lot of people who live in Mississauga who say they live in Toronto, <laughs> you know, cause you sort of, you don't, but you sort of do. Cause it, in that, again, it never really ends the urban sprawl. You know, soon people from Oakville are just going to say, ah, I live in Toronto. I think it comes down to like, do in terms of enjoyment, at least for me, do I have to go to any of these other places? Because if you just centralize yourself, like we kind of have here, we love our neighborhood. But if right. I had to go to Mississauga on any regular basis, I would hate it. It would completely <laughs> flip. Absolutely, completely. And vice versa, just because of how long it would take to go back and forth. So if you live in X area and kind of enjoy that area, but at least in Toronto, like if you have to travel anywhere, any free, on any frequency, like it just destroys the enjoyment because you're just in your car for three hours a day or you're on a bus for three hours a day or you're whatever. And it's, it's a slog to get around. Well, you guys are in a unique position, right? You live close to work. You love your neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. uh, you were able to get in on the housing market when it was reasonable. You know, you guys are the exception to kind of every rule of living in Toronto, right? Are you, are you considering... 
Are you considering changing that scenario? Because you're asking a lot of questions. No, 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 no. I think it's just okay. curiosity. You're always like, <laughs> yeah. like curiosity. No, no, we absolutely do not want to move this. We love it here. This is this is perfect for us. It's great. I know more and more New Yorkers who it's like the notion of leaving the city is, yeah, this far flung fantasy they might have from time to time, but it's never a reality. They're like, there's no way you're ever going to get me out of this city. Right. No, it's, it's fun here. We, we absolutely love it. And the place is great. The neighborhood's great. It's close to getting, you can get out of town in terms of highways pretty easily. Like we did, you described our situation, which is pretty accurate. It's not like we planned it. Didn't do this on purpose. We just kind of got right place, right time, got a little lucky. Um, but very, very happy. You know, will we live here forever? Probably not, but it's it's a really really nice setup. We're very happy. I can say this because you know I'm blessed with uh, being able to work from home and have for eleven twelve years now. It's nice to be able to choose wherever you want to live. Um, I can tell you though, having chosen twice now to live in the suburbs, my third time. It's it's not going to happen. I'm not going to make another move to another suburban suburban area of, of Montreal or, or any city for that matter. It's like I either want the I want the city or I want the small town. But the the, the in between the two is is no place to live. Yeah, I like that. Kind of have to like it's more than the place, the actual physical walls that you live in, right? It's it's what you do outside of that and, and what you want that life to be like i taught a, a semester in person for the first time recently like in the spring in may and the campus this, this is for me what makes me happy it's just lack of commute i mean maya's work you can walk there in like 40 minutes you can ride a bike in right. 15 you know i work from home the majority of the time but even when i teach <laughs> it's a 17 minute walk down the road you know perfect and i don't even have to like just fresh air and walking around and that's I mean, we're really lucky. This is not, you know, how most people most do. But I think if, if you're in the city, that for me, that makes me very happy. Because I remember commuting on the on the subway and stuff and never works and there's delays and you're just crammed in there and it would take an hour and a half. And that wasn't that wasn't good. But I can walk down the street now. And that's uh, that's a nice in terms of city setup, I think, is the best way to say it. You're one of lucky few. For sure. That's so we're not moving. <laughs> we're not moving. <laughs> I had a realtor knock on our door the other day. Like, are you looking to sell? No. No. Yeah. Well, let me tell you how much we like this. So your, maybe your clients can buy, you know, somewhere else around here. But no, we're not There leaving. you go. Are you finding your neighborhoods getting, like, uh, gentrified? Uh, yeah, I think it was before we moved here. Um, it was the big transition. You know, you notice little things, I think. Um. So yes, I guess is the answer, but not significantly more than when we moved in. They are building, the government has, you know, a, a new subway route. Um, one of the paths is right close to where we are. So they're building like the, that stuff, which is interesting, which is ultimately going to be good, but will inconvenient with construction currently. But when it's finished, it'll be great. Um, I guess, yeah, a, a little gentrified, but in, in, a, in a, it still has this little like quaint neighborhood feel to it a lot of businesses that are not huge not changed just like you know one-off some family run some just not family run but just you know this is the only location still got a lot of green space a lot of parks so good gentrified but that's the thing about neighborhoods right like they never stay the same even if you think like i want to live in this neighborhood forever like well guess what like 10 or 15 years from now it's going to be different in, in, in some way yeah. so you don't have control over that well, affordability is never going to stop being an issue in places like Toronto either, no. right? So, um, well, good. I mean, I don't know. I, I could tell you we'll probably be at a, well, we've got a lot of decisions ahead of us, as, as anyone does in life. Uh, whether or not we stay here, eh, I don't know. Sometimes like what we wish we could do is magically transport our condominium to other places you know like that's the, the the fantasy is like oh i wish i could just take this place and put it here for six months you know so i don't have to move my stuff and i got all everything's where i like it and everything works and then uh but six months later it's going to be somewhere else there's a tendency to always think about like the other right the thing that's not our reality or the thing that's not our current 
Bradley, we were at a, a barbecue yesterday. I was talking to a guy, uh, an older guy who has adult kids, and he was telling uh, his daughter and her husband and family, and they keep saying, you know, I guess they have a, a house that's a bit small, or in their words, small. And he's like, I think it's fine. <laughs> you know, two kids. And he says, they keep saying again and again, if only we had an extra bedroom, if only we had this, if only we had that, then we would be happy. Uh, we had kind of like a little, had a couple beers, but a little deeper conversation on how ultimately that's usually not the case. And then you, you, maybe you, you do get that. And then that kind of conversation starts again. And then if only I had this, if only I had that. So I think in terms of housing, especially in a, in a country like this, where it is so expensive and, and, and so front of mind, I think, because the, a lot of the national conversation is about it, rightfully so. Um, but I think it, just like, hey, I don't know if I, moving is would, would change this or that. I think it's not all about what, what you know, I, I need this extra thing. I need this extra thing for mm-hmm. me. Obviously, the space that you live in, because you spend you know most of your time in it is important. But when I walk outside, I can do this and I can do this. It's really nice. It makes me happy. It's a book I read I don't, a long time ago. I think it was called, I want to say The Moral Animal. Mm-hmm. And it it addresses this uh, unquenchable desire for for more and for improvement and for all of this progression in our lives, which served us incredibly well as a species up until, you know, the industrial <laughs> era where we're able to, uh, you know, feed large swaths of people without having to actually capture the food ourselves. And we have shelter, we have clean drinking water, we have medicine, we have stuff. So once all that started coming into play, it doesn't necessarily mean that the thing that n- helped us uh, spread our genes isn't still there, right? It's that kind of monkey brain, like, you know, we're a 100,000 year old operating system here in 2024 trying to run around and connect to the internet. It just doesn't work. So when we think about, we got to, I think we got to give ourselves a bit of a break when it comes to, hey, we're trying too hard to strive for all of these things. It's because if we recognize that's our very nature as a species, not our conditioning because of marketing companies, our purchases and our consumption is maybe in part influenced by a marketing world, but our drive to do it is innate. Right. So sure. when I say it's like, oh, but if I only had that, that's who we are as a people. That's not who we've learned to become as a result of our society. The moral animal. I believe I so, like yeah. It. Worth a, a look. Title. I'm dipping back into Buddhism. Because, you, you know, yeah, I, lo- I love the, I love, I'm a Taoist every day of the week. I love it. It's simple. Commune with I nature, was just yin yang balance. Say, but my brother <laughs> speaking of we started the show talking about five gallon the five gallon podcast yeah he isn't really a podcast guy but when we were doing that show together towards the end he listened to one episode just to like check in and like oh what are these guys talking about on the internet you know the one he listened to was the one about Taoism, and he was like i'm out <laughs> what are you guys I'm like it's not you just- <laughs> yeah, and he still mentions that today. He's like, "Oh, is you guys going to talk about Taoism again? Is that is that what you guys do?" Because <laughs> that's what podcasts are. That's that's fantastic, and I hope that he lives the rest of his life believing that to be true. That would be wonderful for me. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> oh boy. Yeah, you know it's funny though because what I'm doing is is really becoming more again. It's like ah, oh, you know, better study kind of our own ways. That I, I'm I'm a big proponent of self awareness leads to relief of a lot of anxiety, and again, cutting ourselves slack is kind of a Buddhist thing to do. And I'm 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 really digging this idea that it's like, hey, you know, we're trying to train a monkey, and that's not easy. Okay, society and our progressions technologically have advanced far beyond you know, our cognitive capabilities. So, you know, give, give yourself a break. You're, you're going monkey running around in the concrete jungle trying to figure out how the hell everything works. Have you read Sapiens? I have. Okay. I have. First half of the book, highly recommended. I don't know if you agree. I thought it dragged on a little bit, but I found it really fascinating at the, you know, it goes through like all those revolutions, right? So the agricultural revolution, which you're referencing, right? 
so previous yep. people had to move around hunter gatherers right obviously like if you can't grow food you have to hunt food find food and then therefore we're moving around and then as soon as agriculture not invented but like as soon as it was shown how you can do this then we can stay in one location we can farm we can grow food but at the same time then this protective nature of i need to protect my land because you can't come here steal my food that's my food so then this is where this kind of like real estate concept came from where like oh i can this is valuable now it's not just a hill with a tree on it no no i'm growing my food here so we need to protect this and that was right. like for that i mean lots of people talk about this but in that book i remember that point vividly because that was like really really interesting of how that switched that kind of innate switch in, in us right where and that was really a long time ago the industrial revolution was like the next major one but like there's thousands of years in, in between those two things and that was like the main switch of how we actually live in terms of being sedentary not in terms of 2024 of like sitting in a chair and talking on the internet but like not moving and hunting gathering anymore i'm i'm in the middle of something <laughs> this is a scary one uh i don't know if you know uh, robert sapolsky's work but no uh he's, he's a neuroscientist uh, at stanford i believe uh, this one's called determined anyway this will scare the nuts off your body basically because cool. it he posits that the vast majority of the decisions that we make, we are convincing ourselves that we're actually making them, but we're not. We're unconsciously and subconsciously making micro decisions all of the time. And our brain is just rationalizing the decision that's already been determined by us because we are a deterministic machine. Interesting. So you, th you think to yourself that you're making all of these choices, that you have this free will, but you don't. You're... I, I believe that. I, have you read, <laughs> that reminds me of uh, Blink. I mean, if you've read Malcolm Gladwell, no. one of his books no. is called Blink. And it's a similar concept of like split second decisions in, in a blink of an eye, for, let's say, that we make decisions innately subconsciously that we don't even are not aware of and then yes we then think we're using logic and everything to make the decision but we're actually just rationalizing a decision we've already made it's fascinating stuff i'm getting to a place and again this is maybe just tying back to studying buddhism again and getting sort of back into the practices like there's a there's a freeing well there's first there's a really frightening and then there's a freeing there's that sort of, gosh, there might not be anything out there. There might not be a soul within here. There might not be anything but what is actually happening in this moment now and how I'm interpreting it. And then when you start discovering, I might not even be thinking my own thoughts. I might not even be choosing my own actions. That it's, it's terrifying. It's absolutely terrifying. And then all at once, it's super liberating. You know, because then you can take a lot of the the weight and guilt and weird mysticism out of it all and just be. It's a really interesting place to get to, though, because mo I think, I don't know how far you've got with um, Adam Grant's book, Think Again. I don't know how, how deep Think you Think Again, got. about midway. But the chapter on the Dunning-Kruger effect I thought was really, really fascinating. <gasps> where most people don't even get close to what you just described, which might be scary, but also very liberating, where most Dunning-Kruger is basically like people think they know something when actually they don't, and they either pretend right. to or really have convinced themselves that they do know it, and they're just completely wrong. Yep. And he goes through these examples of like, you know, whatever, one to five, you know, you, you, you know more than the average person, the same as the average person or less, and he lists these five things, and people answered, and all of them are false. That like, all of them are not 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 right. correct, right? But so many people would say, like, "Oh no, I know more than the average person on this," and you can't <laughs> because it's not true. And I think just a lot of people, a lot of us, just get to the place of like, and I don't think it's like someone sits down and like, "I'm just gonna I'm gonna believe this." It's just a, a the the process of our brain of how we 
acquire information and how we make decisions is so fascinating to me. I mean, we, it's a, we're basically a filter, right? That takes the, the wide array of inputs that reality seems to be. And we, we, we selectively filter all of that information into something that we can cognitively rationalize, right? So that's, that seems to be what the brain's up to. Then there's the, the physiological aspects that are driving much of our emotional experiences, right? And then our brain interpreting those emotions as something other than what they really are, you know? And through, through all of this process, we're, we're somehow continuously telling ourselves a story about what's happening, right? <laughs> and none of it, it, it turns out, is real at all. None of it. Right. None of it's really real, right? So when I, when I see myself especially behaving in certain ways, it, it becomes, um, this might be the wrong, I'm, I'm bemused by it. It's just this sort of, I, I'm watching my own life unfold and going, this is really interesting what this animal seems to think is actually happening and then how it's responding to its environment and conditioning as opposed to being hmm. directly involved in the, the film as it's taking place around me. Now, maybe this is a healthy delusion. That's, that's between me and my therapist. But for the moment, it's, it's an exploration not only of self, but of reality itself, which, uh, you know, might make the last little bit of life worth living. You describe that book as, as scary. And maybe that's the scary part, because most of us like to be in control, right? We like to know what's going on. We like to... to if if all of us realize that it was true or just came to the conclusion that we have no control over anything, there is nothing that I can do to in, impact anything, I don't know how people would react to that. You know, it's a scary proposition. Um, the brain is wired through evolution to reject new ideas for self-preservation, for going back to thousands of years, agriculture revolution, anything that was new, foreign was a threat, right? So we protect ourselves with things that are unfamiliar, which sounds very basic, and I suppose it is, but ideas are, are grouped into that as well. So in terms of Dunning-Kruger and like all, all these things, I just love learning about this, because the more you learn, the more you realize how little we actually control, you know, what goes on. For a lot of people, that's a very uncomfortable position, you know, and that's, I, you know, go for, good on you, back to church with you, you'll be fine, right? <laughs> Some people need rules and they need to follow them and they need to have kind of a playbook and an explanation of what's going on. Um, me what, less so. If you were a character in the Truman Show would you prefer to be Jim Carrey or would you prefer no. to be one of the actors or the director? I would rather be one of the actors. I like that question a lot. <laughs> how, how about you? God, I don't know. Like, there's a temptation to say I would be Jim Carrey if he never found out. You know what I mean? That that, would be, that, that would be interesting. Um, being one of the actors, I think the director is also appealing because then you're like the puppeteer, right? You're like you're controlling everything. You're in control. There's that position. I don't know. I'm interested why you said the actor because for me, that would be like the least desirable because then I'm involved in something that I know isn't real, but it's also not my story. And I'm, 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 I feel like that's the least desirable where... I'm involved in a life that I know isn't real, but it also I can't move forward with my own inclinations, if that makes sense. Right. I, I can't live a life of ignorance. I just can't, right? Okay. And I don't like, because in my day-to-day -day life, much of what I have to do is decision-making and management of people. 
management of expectations and people and processes. That's my day. And then when I got to go out and do whatever I do normally in the world, I got to do a lot of that again too. I'm one of those folks who I just love sometimes being told what to do and then seeing what happens. I really like that, mm. you know. So there's there's times I fantasized about just going and drifting off into an eight hour a day. I work in a car factory and I can just be alone with my thoughts and pump out the widgets and be told what to do and take my check and I don't have to make any decisions thereafter, right? That's to me kind of appealing. So that where I'd be the actor is that it's that balance of both worlds. I get to enjoy being part of the production, but I'm also not the one who decides what has to be done. And I get to be self-aware enough that through this process, I understand what's going on. So it's, um, yeah, it's a very deterministic position. I like it. I like that. I like that. I guess the fourth option is to be the viewer. That's the fourth wall. There it is on the other side. Yeah. Right. I'm watching the whole thing take place. Yeah. That's too passive for me. I like to be, I like to be yeah. involved in something. That's an interesting question. Well, you can tell your brother that we did <laughs> uh, dabble in at least some Eastern philosophy today. I'll give him the timestamps and he can check it out. You remember Ajita, of course. We had her on the of show. Course. Friend of the show, friend of us. I don't know if I ever told you the time that she taught me how to meditate. I don't know. Oh, we had a deal. She's like, you play guitar, yes? And I said, I do. You, you're a yogi, right? She said, I am. I said, great. I'll teach you guitar. You teach me yoga. So I would go to her place in Eskazoo, and I would teach her guitar lessons in the morning. She would come to my place on uh, mornings and, and practice yoga. So she taught me how to, to meditate because she's like a Vipassana meditator. Anywho, one day I was meditating and I had one of those, I don't know, epiphany is a word, but I don't think it was that. It was more like a, whoa, that's cool. And it was this very clear vision and understanding that everything within our visual and sensory proximity, we are not necessarily projecting, but manifesting and generating. Like kind of like a, like, you know, when you're in a video game, and you're doing that like role playing, you're running around and the computer's only going to generate everything that's around you as a character. Like, it's not going to generate the whole world, just the slice of the world that you need to see. And then everything else is just bits and scattered and opportunity. So this kind of quantum reality that everything is opportunity all at once. And then it collapses into reality in the moment that it's observed, right? We're the observer, everything collapses around us. I, and I, I leapt out of my meditation position, got on the bus, went to Eskazu, pounded on our door, opened it, I said, it's all being generated by us. It's like, we're, we're manifesting the reality that we experience. And she's like, oh yes, of course. <laughs> <laughs> like, so matter of fact, like, how did you not know that? Duh. Uh, we are the Sims. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> All right. Interesting. Are we meditating now? Do we leave it? Is it? Is it? Is this I think it? we're. This. This is it. Could you imagine if we did a guided meditation for people? I think that would be quite pleasant or unpleasant, depending Probably on who you are. Of both. I'd like to do that for your brother. We should do a guided meditation, a separate episode that is just, you know, manifestation of all of your dreams from a Taoist perspective. I think you'd like that. Okay. Is that it? I think that's it. Yeah, I'm done. Yeah, me too. I'm going to use the restroom. Okay. <laughs> Goodbye. Bye. <laughs>